Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Great to see Harold. Um, as Harold said, uh, I have worked before in health insurance and done some work on dental care. Have not previously done much work on hospital care. So this is a, both a new paper and also a new research area for me. So I'm, I'm very much um, interested in, in, your, in your comments and your feedback. The paper is, is co-authored with Helen Levy, my colleague at Michigan, and Saye Nikpe, who was one of our PhD students and now is in the medical school at Vanderbilt. And it has grown out of some work that we're doing with the state of Michigan. Michigan, you may know, was one of the states that expanded their Medicaid program, um, but they did it with a waiver from CMS. And with the waiver, there needs to be uh, a formal evaluation. We're part of a University of Michigan team that is evaluating the Healthy Michigan Plan, which is what it's called. And um, Helen and I, in particular, are responsible for looking at the impact of the expansion on insurance coverage and hospital uncompensated care. So we haven't gotten to the point yet where we uh, have uh, results on what's happened in Michigan, but that got us started to think about this issue in general. Um, and so this is a, a paper looking at national data. And, and just to sort of set the, the background, obviously the, the, the policy context is the Affordable Care Act, which um, I'm sure everybody knows is, is a very uh, comprehensive and, and, and complicated uh, piece of legislation that involves essentially all aspects of the healthcare system. Um, but I would argue that, that at its core, uh, the most important provisions in the Affordable Care Act have to do with insurance coverage. Um, and the two major insurance provisions um, went into effect in January 2014. That's the expansion of the, the Medicaid program, establishing uh, a national, or should have been, a national eligibility limit of 138% of of poverty, um, and also the private market reforms, uh, which included, among other things, the establishment of these health insurance exchanges, um, now called the marketplaces, where people who don't have access to affordable employer-sponsored health insurance can go to the exchange, and if their income is between 100 and 400 percent of poverty, they qualify for a, a premium tax credit that they can use to, to purchase insurance. Um, so the, the, the plan was that this would create um, a, a new set of national options uh, to make insurance available and affordable, uh, particularly for everybody below the poverty level. Um, as you all know, uh, not every state chose to implement the Medicaid expansion. So this map um, shows you the, the current status of which states have implemented and which states haven't, the, the blue states um, randomly chosen that color uh, are the ones that have um, have implemented the expansion. The the, the gray states, again, just purely random, um, is are, are the states that have not expanded as of today. And you can see there's been a sort of a gradual uh, uh, increase in, in, in 2014 when, when the policy first went into effect. Um, we only had 27 states and, and now we're up to 32. But we still have um, obviously a large number of states and a, and a large population that has not uh, been exposed to this expansion. And so what you're seeing in terms of early research on the Affordable Care Act, and our paper is an example of this, is that people have been using this contrast between expansion states and non-expansion states, not to, to estimate the entire effect of the Affordable Care Act, but to ask the question, what has been the, the, uh, the effect of, of the Medicaid expansion on, on various outcomes? And overall, obviously, uh, I'm sure you know that, that the impact on, of, of the entire set of policies on insurance coverage has been dramatic. Um, so this is data from uh, the Gallup poll, uh, data from federal surveys, data from other um, new surveys by RAND and, and the Urban Institute tell more or less the same story, which is that there's been a dramatic decline in, in the percent of the non-elderly population uh, without insurance. Um, so different. I, I think in, in um, President Obama's JAM article, he points to 20 million people who have gained in coverage. If you go back uh, to 2010, um, to the most recent data. Um, and we know um, that there's a large body of research predating the Affordable Care Act uh, on the effect of insurance coverage and on the effect of, of expanding coverage. Um, and it tells a pretty clear story about what happens uh, when people gain insurance coverage, 
Um, there's improved access to care. There, there's a, a growing number of studies that, that show positive health effects. And one of the things that I think is, is interesting, and it's a, it's a smaller set of studies, but I think it's really important, is that insurance expansions are associated with improvements in financial well-being. Because if you think about what health insurance really is, it's a financial product. It's designed to protect you against the, the cost of, of, a, of a large, uh, possibly catastrophic health shock. Um, and so the, the, one of the key results from the Oregon health insurance experiment was that people almost immediately saw an improvement in, in their financial situation. Uh, my colleague at, at the Ross School, Sarah Miller, has done uh, a couple of very interesting studies. One, looking at the Massachusetts uh, coverage expansion, where she saw that there was an improvement in financial outcomes um, for people who gained coverage in, in um, uh, Massachusetts. And the, the second study, Hugh et al., she's a co-author, and they're looking at some of the early evidence from the Affordable Care Act. And again, we're seeing that um, there's an improvement in credit scores, there's a reduction in overdue debt, um, and, and there's a number of, of financial benefits, um, which are very real for households, um, but they're also significant for healthcare providers. Because as you know, um, in the US, uh, hospitals um, are required to treat uh, patients who, who present in an emergent condition, regardless of their ability to pay. This is the EMTALA law. And um, as a result, uh, that there's a strong correlation between uninsurance in the population and um, uncompensated hospital care. So one recent study estimated that every uninsured person um, generates, uh, on average, $900 of uncompensated hospital care. And um, the, the American Hospital Association estimates that in 2013, uh, the cost to American hospitals was about $45 billion. So this is one reason that um, in the, the buildup to the passage of the Affordable Care Act, uh, the American Hospital Association and state hospital associations were strong advocates for, um, for health care reform. And today, in states where the expansion hasn't happened, you still have hospitals that are lobbying uh, for states to, to implement the expansion. Um, this is a graph from a paper that we published um, earlier this year that um, sort of captures what uh, expansion, the Medicaid expansion does to payer mix and sort of gives you a sense for um, you know, why the hospitals have been in favor of expansion. And it also, I think, is useful to, to set up our research design. So, so this is um, data from the HCUP Fast Stats program. It's a, it's a, you can download this um, an Excel file from HRQ. And it's state level aggregation of hospital discharges at the quarterly level. And these are data for um, non-Medicare. Um, and there's a few things that I'll point out, because again, it sets up uh, the, the paper I'm going to present today very well. Um, so there's, there's six lines, uh, three types of coverage, and then um, a comparison between expansion states and non-expansion states. Um, the expansion states are the solid lines, the non-expansion are the dashed. And if you look at the top line, you see that um, going back to 20, uh, 2009, there's been a, a, a gradual but steady decline in the percentage of, of hospital patients with private insurance. Um, and if you look at the, the, the percent private, uh, both the level and the trend are essentially identical for um, the expansion and non-expansion states. Um, so that sort of sets up, uh, uh, I think, justification for using the non-expansion states as kind of a control group for what happened in, in the expansion states. If you look at um, the percent with Medicaid and the percent who are uninsured, the levels aren't identical. Um, before the ACA, uh, the expansion states tended to have more generous Medicaid programs. So you have a slightly higher percent Medicaid and a corresponding uh, lower percent uninsured compared to the non-expansion states. Um, but the lines are pretty much parallel. So, so you can see that as private insurance was declining, some of those patients were becoming uninsured, some of those patients were picking up Medicaid, um, but, but the trends were, were really quite similar um, in the two groups of states until the first quarter of 2014 uh, when the ACA Medicaid expansion went in, in 27 states. Um, and you see immediately a, a change in payer mix, really nothing going on with private patients. 
Um, there's probably a lot of reasons for that. But if you think about Medicaid, it's very easy to sign up. And in fact, you can sign up at the hospital. So we would expect to see uh, a much more immediate change in um, not just in enrollment, but actually in enrollment of patients. Um, and that's what we see. Uh, we see an increase, uh, discrete jump up in percent Medicaid in our expansion states, really no change in non-expansion states. And, and we see that that um, gain in, in Medicaid patients was really coming from the ranks of the uninsured. So there's been some other uh, papers that have looked at what this means for um, hospital uncompensated care. So this is a really nice um, policy brief by uh, coming out of ASPE, where they, um, they went on investor calls for, non, for, for uh, national for-profit hospital chains that were reporting results um, in the first quarter of 2014. And already, those hospitals were saying, we're seeing a reduction in uncompensated care uh, from our facilities in, in expansion states. Um, with Helen and Saie, we, we did a short paper in Health Affairs looking at um, trends in Connecticut uh, compared to other northeastern states. We chose Connecticut because Connecticut was one of a handful of states that took the option of expanding their Medicaid program early. So they actually began implementing the Medicaid expansion in 2011. And you can see uh, very quickly there was an increase in Medicaid revenue and a decline in uncompensated care relative to what was going on in, in neighboring states. Um, and then. Uh, uh, David Dranoff, Craig Garthwaite, and, and Chris Ode from Northwestern have a recent paper that also just came out in Health Affairs um, using essentially the data that we have uh, in this paper. Um, we, have, we have another year of data. We have a slightly different sample, but it's, it's hospital cost report data. And they're finding large um, reductions in hospital uncompensated care. Um, the question is, what does that mean for the hospital's uh, financial bottom line. And here, at least if, if, if you read um, you know, the newspaper and the trade press, it, it's not obvious that, that hospitals are, are, are seeing real benefits, um, or it's sort of a mixed story. So uh, the, the, the article in Crane's uh, Detroit Business um, talks about hospitals in Southeast Michigan, Henry Ford Hospital, Beaumont, and um, there, uh, they're seeing really large, not only declines in uncompensated care, but, but improvements in, in net operating income. Um, just, just really remarkable uh, positive changes because of the fact that 600,000 people in Michigan are now signed up uh, with Healthy Michigan. On the other hand, Arizona is uh, an expansion state. Um, and this article from, from the Tucson paper is saying that, that Arizona hospitals aren't really seeing much in improvement. Some of the articles, other articles suggest that um, you know, some hospitals in non-expansion states are seeing a benefit from, from the exchange and, and other articles sort of point to, to mixed results. So the question is, how do we reconcile uh, the very clear uh, change in payer mix, shift away from uninsured patients um, to more Medicaid patients? Um, evidence suggesting that, that uncompensated care has fallen with this kind of um, mixed result uh, in terms of hospital uh, net income. Um, so these are the questions that we're going to ask. Uh, we're going to look at these three outcomes. Um, we're going to start looking at Medicaid revenue because um, before we start attributing changes in uncompensated care or uh, operating income uh, to the expansion, we want to be able to show that, in fact, there's been this increase in Medicaid revenue. Um, we're going to look at uncompensated care. Again, uh, other people have done that. And so in that sense, our, our uh, analysis is fairly similar. Um, but then we're going to look at net operating income and operating margins, which is something that, that um, prior studies, including our, our earlier one, did not look at. Um, and one of the things that we think um, is, is important to do is to take account of the fact that the Medicaid expansion meant different things in different states. And, and really, uh, we think the most important source of heterogeneity is what type of Medicaid program they had prior to the Affordable Care Act. Because a number of states, like Massachusetts, for example, with its, its 2006 reform, already uh, had eligibility limits that were at or above 138% of poverty for all adults. So there, you wouldn't expect to see um, much of a change. On the other hand, in Michigan, 
we had fairly low uh, income limits for parents and, and no coverage for um, childless adults. And so um, uh, we would expect to see a bigger impact. And so we, we take a very simple approach to, to distinguishing um, what we call minor expansion states, states where the law is not really representing a, a, a major change in eligibility limits, and major expansion states where the policy should have had, had more bite. And I, sh I should say, um, I realize I'm talking fast. Uh, feel free to, to, to interrupt me, ask questions. How are you defining uncompensated care? Is it, is it cost of care or is it charges for care? It's cost of care using a cost of charges ratio from the cost report. Um, and and uh, certainly anything to do with, with the data, I'm, I'm very open to suggestions. I'm sort of just learning the, the, the cost report data. The other minor point, when you say somebody's got Medicaid coverage, uh, oftentimes uh, the hospital, when they come to the hospital, they find out they're, uh, they qualify, they apply. So when you talk about Medicaid, is that Medicaid paid for a claim or the patient was a Medicaid eligible patient at admission? Um, I think it's in, in the hospital data, I'm assuming it's, it's that the Medi Medicaid pay for, paid for the claim. Uh, I'm going to show you some data to, to set things up. That's from the American Community Survey, you know, population data, and that's going to be survey data about coverage. So it's not going to match up exactly with uh, what they have when they go to the hospital. This is a like many uh, slides ago, but one of the points you said that overall wealth was increasing for people who have now have coverage. The thing that I keep hearing from people like who have now joined these going places is that it's you know before they didn't pay. Large population are, are relatively healthy who don't go to the hospital much. Who have now entered these these shares who are saying now they're paying so much more, right? Because of zero versus whatever they're paying monthly. So how is that? Like who is, is that? How is wealth increasing for, for this Yeah. So so I should back up and say that the um, the research that I was citing was looking at um, the expansion of either Medicaid or Medicaid-like coverage which has very minimal cost sharing. So there you would go from being uninsured and being faced with a large medical bill if you, if you went to the hospital or, or even more so if you went to the doctor. Um, and now with Medicaid, you don't have that. And so so it's, it's protecting you from you know, maxing out your credit card to pay for a visit, um, having to borrow money from family and friends to pay for a visit. Uh, you're right that the, um, the exchange coverage is, is expensive both in terms of if you didn't have insurance before, now you're paying premiums that are expensive. And uh, I think one of the, the, the things that's interesting that comes out of our papers is indirectly we're seeing evidence of the fact that a lot of the coverage, not only in the exchange, but offered by small employers, offered outside the exchange, has very high cost sharing. So you can still be generating uncompensated care. You can have insurance, you can go to the hospital, and, and still have a bill that you can't pay. So um, other people in this room probably have a better handle on this. My sense is, I mean, dish payments are supposed to come down uh, because of the ACA, because of the, the, the thought that now more people have insurance. I think that that hasn't gone into effect yet. That, that's sort of been pushed off to 2018. Um, yeah. Or, or maybe even later. I'm not sure the latest. OK. So um, here's what I want to try to cover from here on in. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about um, uh, uncompensated care and, and some of the measures we're using. And that's going to get to the, the, the earlier question about uh, how we're defining it and measuring it. I'll talk about how we're distinguishing between these different sets of expansion states. And then based on those first two pieces, we, we can make some predictions about what we should see in the data and the cost report data. Uh, I'll describe the cost report data. Uh, the, the Research design is, is quite simple. It's just um, difference in differences models. Um, and, and the results are, are pretty straightforward. So um, uncompensated care is, is simply care that the hospital provides uh, to a patient, but they're not paid for. Um, and it's the sum of charity care. So the patient comes in, and the hospital knows this person is never going to be able to pay, and they just write it off right there and bad debt, 
which is the case where the hospital sends the person home with a bill, but, but the, the, the bill is never paid, or at least not paid in full. Um, we're going to combine those two I I into an overall measure of uncompensated care because um, hospitals vary in, in their, their charity care policies. So one hospital may uh, see a patient and say, we're going to write it off right away. Another hospital might see the same patient and, and try to collect. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's the same. And, and I think that there's also uh, reason to think that hospitals may, even if they have a charity care policy, may not always um, implement it the same way. Uh, so, so at least in this paper, we're not going to try to draw distinctions between um, those two sources of, of, of charity care, uh, of, of uncompensated care. So um, just some simple equations, just, just to, to get a sense of, of what uh, could be driving our results. So uncompensated care is going to come from um, uh, the cost of treating uninsured patients, and um, there's going to be a certain amount of uncompensated care generated by privately insured patients. Uh, who can't pay their, their deductible or their cost sharing. So C is the cost of, of care, um, the X's are the number of patients, and, and B sub P is the fraction of the bill that um, the privately insured patients are unable to pay. Um, and it's important to note that uh, Medicaid patients do not figure into this equation at all. Um, now hospitals complain a lot about the fact that because Medicaid pays so much less than, than private insurers, that the difference between those Medicaid rates and either what the private insurers are paying or the, or the, the charges that the hospital would like to collect, um, they view that as a form of, of uncompensated or undercompensated care. Um, but the, the strict definition of uncompensated care does not include um, that shortfall. So then looking at, at hospitals' revenue, uh, again, here's a simple equation that, that um, summarizes the, the sources of revenue. And for simplicity, uh, we're just going to ignore Medicare. Medicare should not have been changing over this period. So just I like, left it out of the equation, but it wouldn't change anything to add it in. Um, and so the revenue is just going to be the number of Medicaid patients you see times the, the, the payment rate for Medi Medicaid. Uh, the number of private patients you see uh, times the net payment you receive um, from, uh, from privately insured patients. And I think, as is well known, there are really big differences between these two, two reimbursement rates. Um, this is a, paper, a graph from a paper by, by Tom Selden and, and colleagues that is using the MEPS data to compare um, payments received by hospitals for uh, Medicaid, Medicare, and privately insured patients. And so in this graph, Medicaid and, and private are both um, expressed as a percentage of, of the Medicare rate. And what you see is that um, there's a, a, a large and growing gap between um, the amount that hospitals receive from privately insured patients and what they receive from, from Medicaid. Actually, if you would show me that graph and you didn't put the y-axis on it, I would have guessed that that Medicaid line would be much lower than 100% than it actually is. Lower than, than Medicare. Yeah, I was, yeah. I, I was always under the impression that that disparity was greater than this graph. I, I agree with that. Yeah, that, that was a surprise to me. Um, and the, the fact that the, the private is increasing so much, that's not a surprise. I mean, that, that's sort of what we're seeing with, um, you know, stuff out of the, the Healthcare Cost Institute shows that. <coughs> but um, I think to address Harold's point, perhaps, um, um, when you're looking at a rate as a percent of another rate, it's going to depend on the nature of the rate you're looking at. If you're looking at it as, is it rate per day? Is it rate per patient? Is it an ERG adjusted rate? Yeah, that's a good point, and I and I can't recall from this how they. Um, uh, I think. I, I to be honest, I, I can't remember what what they did in this paper. Um, so, so so what this means is you know going back to to to, um, to this equation. Uh, if we see an increase in, in Medicaid patients, all else equal, that's going to improve uh, the hospital's bottom line. Their, their revenue, total revenue is going to go up. But if some of those patients would have otherwise had private insurance, that's going to go in the opposite direction. And th this is the, how Medicaid expansion can possibly be a, a mixed bag from the perspective of hospitals. Well, but I think there's another factor there, too. I mean, to the extent that it used to be fairly universally true that privately 
the private insurance rates were set at a level where private insurance payments generated revenue for hospitals <coughs> and to compensate for uncompensated care to a large extent. If that begins to go away, then your balance has another factor beyond what you mentioned. Yeah, that's right. So, so to the extent that there's, there's cost shifting, um, you know, the, the, the private, we're, we're sort of treating the private price as fixed, but it, it could be endogenous to the, the number of Medicaid patients you have. Yeah, so this, this is just sort of the, the equations. We definitely are treating that, that private prices as uh, fixed here. Um, as far as our empirical work, it's, it's not important, um, but, but you're right. So, so the question is, what is the effect of expanding Medicaid eligibility on these two outcomes, uncompensated care and hospital revenue? Um, and so the way we think about this is that um, the number of patient type I uh, that the hospital sees is going to be a function of the eligibility limit E. Um, so as you increase the eligibility limit, the effect on, on number of Medicaid patients is sort of obvious. You're going to see, you know, the, if there's more Medicaid eligibility in the population, you're going to see more Medicaid patients. Um, uninsured patients should go in the opposite direction. And private patients can fall as well. Um, so if there's crowd out, people that would have otherwise had private insurance will now be enrolling in Medicaid. Um, and, the, and that's the, the, a, a possible concern for, um, for hospitals. So if we look at uncompensated care, which recalls is a positive function of, of uninsured patients and, and um, privately insured patients. Since both of these uh, effects are negative, uncompensated care is going to have to fall. Even if there's crowd out, um, you know, as, as there's fewer uninsured patients, there's fewer people that are not paying their deductibles. Um, so so uh, that's always going to be the case whether or not there's crowd out. Um, but in the case of revenue, it's, it's it's uncertain because here we have um, two components. Uh, the increase in, in Medicaid patients, all else equal, is, is raising revenues. But to the extent that um, private patients are falling, that's causing revenues to decline. Uh, and it's ambiguous. And if there's no crowd out, if every new Medicaid enrollee had previously been uninsured, um, then revenue has to increase because the second term in that equation four is zero. Um, but if there's crowd out, then the expansion of Medicaid is only going to increase hospital revenues if um, the ratio of, of the payment rates is high relative to the degree of crowd out. So, so the right-hand term uh, in this inequality is the, the degree of crowd out, the percentage of new Medicaid <coughs> enrollees that would have otherwise had private insurance. The left-hand side is the ratio of the Medicaid rate to the net private rate. And we saw that that's um, you know, may maybe two-thirds. And so as long as crowd out's not too, too great, as long as most of the newly insured people are coming from the ranks of the uninsured, it's likely that, that um, uh, the revenue is going to go up. But if we're in a state where the, the Medicaid rate is really low compared to private, or if we're in a situation where um, there's a high degree of crowd out, then that could have a negative effect on revenue. And so what we're going to do is, is to try to, to draw a distinction between states where there was more or less uh, crowd out to be expected. Is there an expected point where it will be feasible or sensible to uh, take into account preventative medicine um, improvements? You mean so, so, so that by expanding insurance coverage will actually reduce um, hospitalization? Yeah. So that's not something that's going to factor into our analysis. I, I think that that's, um, a lot of people uh, want to see that, and, and, and it's not clear that there's great evidence for it. I'm going to show you um, a couple bonus slides from a different paper where we're not seeing, we're seeing something that, that, that suggests that's not happening yet. But um, OK, so, so um, our thought is that, that as you move your eligibility limit up the, the income distribution, um, you're going to increase Medicaid coverage less because there's fewer uh, uninsured people to insure. And crowd out is going to be a bigger issue because more of those people who gain coverage would have otherwise been in, in uh, you know, had the possibility of getting private insurance coverage. And so we think that a useful way to 
distinguish um, among different expansion states is to compare those that um, uh, were starting off at a high level of eligibility with those that weren't. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, again, people in this room know that, that before the ACA, uh, all states were, were covering children at or above 138% of poverty. So, so the variation that we're gonna get is gonna pertain entirely to, to adults. Um, and when we started looking at states, we decided that we would cut the data in terms of what the eligibility rules were prior to 2010 for parents and what they were for childless adults. And we initially thought, well, there, there, there's three groups of, of states. Uh, there are states that are already were covering all adults at or above 100% of poverty, um, you know, the, on the far left. And then there are states that, that were uh, covering parents fairly generously, but, but not um, childless adults. And then finally, there were groups where either they weren't covering uh, childless adults at all or, or, or the, the limits were very low. When we started looking at the data, both population coverage data and our cost report data, we kept seeing that, that these states look very similar in terms of what was happening in change of coverage. Um, you know, the, the, the estimates were almost identical. And we just decided that it would be simpler, um, rather than having three categories that were interacting with a, a, a policy dummy, um, that we would group these states together and call them major expansion states. Um, and kind of ignore some of the heterogeneity within there. And then we're gonna call these other states um, minor expansion states. Um, again, getting at how much uh, of, of a change the ACA represented. So let me show you some, some um, graphs uh, describing patterns of coverage both before um, the ACA uh, main provisions went into effect and the change in coverage. This is from the American Community Survey. Um, and this uh, is data on, on non-elderly adults, uh, breaking, breaking it down into our, our, our three categories. And what you see is not surprising. Um, the, major ex the minor expansion states uh, had much higher rates of, of Medicaid coverage than the other two groups of states. Um, the major expansion states in yellow were um, somewhat higher than, than the non-expansion states, but they were more similar. If you look at private coverage, uh, there were smaller differences among the states. Um, and then you look at, at the percent uninsured, they sort of um, mirror the, the differences in, in Medicaid coverage. So, so the states that had already expanded their Medicaid program um, had the lowest rates of, of uninsurance. And the, the non-expansion states, which tended to have the, the least generous Medicaid programs, had the highest rates of, of uninsurance. So now let me show you the changes in coverage between 2013 in 2014, when the main, uh, you know, when the Medicaid expansion and the exchanges went into effect, um, and the, the results from Medicaid are more or less what you would expect. Um, in the major expansion states, we see the largest increase in in Medicaid coverage, um, 3.5 percent uh, percentage points. In in the minor expansion states, even though the new rules were not binding. Um, there was sort of a welcome mat effect, that, that there was an increase in uh, coverage among people who, who already met the eligibility standard. Um, and there was a small welcome mat effect in, in the non-expansion states, but, but, but quite small. Um, so you don't see much change in, in uh, Medicaid coverage there. You see Medicaid coverage, um, private coverage going up in all three states, but here, um, the ordering is different. Uh, we see the largest gains in, in private coverage um, in the non-expansion states. And, and part of this is just really uh, a function of the structure of the ACA where you know, the, the, the Medicaid expansion limits go up to 138 of poverty. Um, the exchange tax credit started at 100%. So you have people in this, this, this range in between where in Illinois, if you were to go to the exchange, they would direct you to a Medicaid plan. And if you, in Missouri, if you went to the exchange, you would end up with private insurance. So it's, it's not surprising that would, we would see more gain in private insurance in, in the um, non-expansion states. Do you, um, do you distinguish between private on the exchange and private employer-based insurance? Or do you yeah, so, so I didn't put it here just to keep the, the graph simple. But if you, if, you, if you dig a little bit deeper, um, all the 
essentially all of the gain in private coverage in all three types of states is coming in non-group or individual coverage, um, which we, the ACS doesn't break out exchange versus other types of non-group, but we think that that's mainly exchange coverage. And do you know anything about the rates that are being paid on these changes? The, the amounts, the, the premiums? Well, you just, yeah, I mean, you made this, you know, good argument, right, about yeah. the revenues being quite different, but I wonder. Oh, the rates are being paid by the, the um, Yes. No, I, I, I think that's absolutely right, and I don't have good data on that. Um, but my sense is that, uh, you know, when, when insurers develop these plans for the exchanges to control the cost, we know they went to narrow networks, right? So there, there were a lot of, uh, and, and, and they tend to exclude the higher cost providers. But I think in some cases they also presented the, um, you know, the hospitals that they were contracting with, here, here's what we're going to pay for exchange coverage, and it was a lot less than what they had been paying for employer-sponsored coverage. Um, I don't know how that settled. I mean, how much hospitals pushed back and said, we're not going to be in your network if you don't pay us the same for all. But yeah, so, so these exchange plans are going to be um, thinner coverage in a number of dimensions uh, than historically employer-sponsored coverage has been. And I think that's one of the reasons why the um, initial premiums were, were much lower than CBO was projecting, because CBO was looking at employer-sponsored insurance and just thought the two types of coverage would be identical, and that hasn't been the case. So when you, I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry. So when you actually, so maybe I should let you just get to your analysis. When you're, are you able, when, when you're looking at hospital costs, do you, do you actually have the charges, so, or the, the amount they got paid? So you're able to look at the actual amount they got paid rather than well, we're able to look at, at some of the amounts that, that they get paid. Unfortunately, with the, the Medicare cost data, we can't break out what they're getting from private insurers. Um, so, so that's why we, we go to a different data source to indirectly get at that. But yeah, we, we, don't, we aren't able to drill very deep in terms of what's happening to private revenue in general and then uh, you know, what making distinctions among types of private plans. Yeah, I think it's changes in, in, in percentages of the population. Yeah. Um, so, so if you look at the, the, the net effect on um, the uninsured, what you see is uh, these major expansion states have the largest decline in uninsured, um, but the other two categories of states do as well. And what's really interesting, and I think what's going to be important for our analysis, is that the, the decline in percent uninsured is basically the same in our minor expansion states and the non-expansion states, um, but with very different sources of coverage. We, we have mainly that's coming from private insurance uh, in the non-expansion states, and most of the, the, the declines in uninsured are coming from public insurance in the minor expansion states. So again, keep in mind what that means for, for hospital um, uh, revenue. And so then, um, because our analysis of, of the cost report data is going to use a difference in differences um, set up, we, we do some, some simple difference in differences here, just literally just taking the, those, those changes and, and subtracting out the, the non-expansion states. And what you see is that um, we see this, this significant increase in Medicaid coverage, but then relative to the counterfactual of the non-expansion states, private insurance coverage is falling uh, in our expansion states. So this is a, a form of crowd out. I mean, it's not crowd out the way we typically think of it, which is people dropping their private coverage to, to, to go onto public. But it's, um, it's saying essentially, if these states hadn't done uh, the Medicaid expansion, how much of um, the Medicaid enrollment would have gone into private? And if you see, in, in, if you know, for the blue bars, for the minor expansion states, more than 100% of the, the gain in Medicaid coverage, you know, corresponds to a decline in private coverage. Um, and for the, the major expansion states, we see some crowd out, but say roughly a third. Um, and again, th this is going to help us think about what 
we should see in terms of um, what's going on in, in, in the hospital data. So, so the first prediction that, that's very obvious from uh, these graphs is that we should see an increase in Medicaid revenue in our expansion states relative to non-expansion and that the difference should be largest uh, when we compare the major expansion states um, to, to the non-expansion states. Um, but even, even these minor expansion states where there wasn't much of a change in eligibility, we know that there was, there was an uh, increase in relative coverage. So we would expect to see more, more Medicaid revenue there. Um, we should see sort of the reverse pattern uh, for uncompensated care. Again, we should see the largest declines in uncompensated care in our major expansion states. Um, and we should see a decline in uncompensated care in the minor expansion states, even though the changes in insurance coverage overall were the same, because in minor expansion states, the gains in coverage were mainly in Medicaid. Uh, in the, the non-expansion states, they were mainly in um, private coverage. And going back to the, to the comment about the exchange coverage, the, these private plans have really large cost sharing, um, you know, high deductibles, uh, uh, high co-pays, and, and in some cases, surprise medical bills if you go to this hospital and you find out that, that one of the, the physicians was not in your network. Um, and then finally, uh, we think that, that net income should be increasing in these major expansion states relative to non-expansion states. Um, and it's less clear uh, what's going on in, you know, when we compare the, the minor expansion states to the non-expansion. Um, because of the fact that, that there's no difference in coverage. And in one case, we, we, we expect to see larger declines in uncompensated care. On the other hand, um, we know that the private plans are paying more than, than the Medicaid. In the setup, you're also layered in the, the effects of relative generosity of Medicaid. Are you able to? No, unfortunately, um, that, that I wish we could. I, th I think that would be um, uh, a really nice thing to do, is be able to compare states that are generous in terms of provider payments to those that aren't, but we don't have that, that data. Could you remind me again, what, what's the time period of your data? For your yeah, um, it is, uh, oh, slide after this. It's 2011 to, to 2015. Okay. Yeah, so, so the, the, the source of the data uh, is the Medicare cost reports. These are, these are reports that, that all hospitals, all hospitals that, that treat Medicare patients are required to, to file with CMS annually. Um, and, uh, you know, initially this, the, 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 these reports were first developed when hospitals were paid on a cost plus basis, even though they're not paid that way anymore. Um, they, they, they still are used uh, uh, in various ways. And it's really um, probably the, the, the best available data on um, hospital finances. Uh, there are some limitations. Um, these are not audit reports. They don't line up exactly with, with um, uh, financial statements. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, for our purposes, th the reports don't break out revenue by all payment sources. So we can't look to see what's happened to private revenue over time. We can, only, we can look at what's happened to Medicaid um, and overall revenue, uh, but private and uninsured are, are sort of lumped together. So, so the sample um, starts in 2011. Uh, these are fiscal year data to 2015. W we start there because they changed the forms between 2010 and 2011. Um, and so to have consistent data, we, we, we start at 2011. Um, the, the dependent variables are, are the ones that, that, that I've described. Um, all of our uh, analysis uses hospital fixed effects. So we only have a small number of other covariates, things that are going to be varying from year to year. Um, and, and as you might imagine, they don't really have much effect. So, um, so here, here's some summary statistics broken down by, by our three categories uh, of states. Um, a couple things to note. Not surprisingly, uh, the average hospital in the minor expansion states uh, has a lot more Medicaid revenue um, than the other two states. And, major expansion uh, are next because they, they had more generous programs before. But the major expansion and non-expansion states are, are relatively similar in terms of the average amount of, uh, of Medicaid revenue they receive. Um, the, the, the pattern with uncompensated care 
might be a little bit surprising. We see that the, the minor expansion states, um, even though they had more insurance coverage in those states, also had more uncompensated care. Um, that's a little bit has to do with, with the mix of for-profit and non-profit. If you look down at the, just below the dotted line, we see that um, non-expansion states uh, tend to be in the south. There's, there's much more for-profit hospitals, and on average, they, they provide less uncompensated care. Um, if, you, if you look at, at non-profit hospitals and you compare across the three categories, the pattern goes uh, the way you would expect with um, less uncompensated care uh, in, the, in the minor expansion states. Um, Um, it was more the latter. I worry about it. <laughs> uh, uh, former, I guess. Um, yeah, so, so this was sort of first pass to, 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 um, to, to sort of group states in, into broad categories. And, and there's probably a lot more that we could do, not only with, with accounting for variation across states, but also within states. I mean, within, you know, so I, I gave you, the, the, I just cited that article from, uh, uh, about Michigan. Well, I think the University of Michigan hasn't seen a, a lot of change in its payer mix because one, it's a more affluent community, and two, the hospital was at full capacity already, so um, it just, there wasn't much margin to add new patients that weren't coming in. So, so, so I, th I think that there's uh, additional variation that we could be exploiting that we're not. Seems like there's a Yeah, that's right. And, and again, the, 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 the fact that we, the data seems to suggest that, that you know, our, those two different sets of states that we pulled together are similar is kind of surprising. Um, so it probably should, we should spend more time understanding why they're similar, even though they were starting from different points. You, you're assuming that Medicare didn't change, but you've got dish payments being reduced under the ACA. And I don't know if in 2015 that was implemented. I can't remember. Uh, it wasn't implemented yet. Okay, so that didn't Yeah. Happen. Just, um, Colleen, for your question on, on the size of these standard deviations, I think these numbers are average per hospital. And because of the huge variation in the size of the hospitals, you'd expect a huge variation in the standard deviations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's another thing that, that I feel like I don't have as good a handle as I should is, is we are um, yeah, pooling hospitals that are of very different sizes. Um, so I'll show you some estimates where we're using the log of these outcomes, but, but we haven't had the time to really sort of understand um, heterogeneity. Are, are there different changes depending on hospital size, depending on, on, on location within the state? Um, those are all directions that we probably should explore. So generosity, so the idea is that, that 
T what is the idea? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is that there's t over time, we know that there's, um, there's a high deductible health care that right. are entering and becoming more dominant. Potentially, the only plans that are being offered in some communities. And so, and that's, that's on the exchange, but it's also not on the exchange, right? right? And so, I wonder whether you can just use the industry data to kind of capture to what extent before these changes occur, um, <laughs> is insurance generosity already an issue? Because right. that's going to tell you something about how salient the change is in the Medicaid eligible. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right. And if you go back to that, that inequality I showed, it, it'd be nice if, if we could nail down both pieces of that. Um, and, and so on one hand, there's going to be differences across states in terms of what the Medicaid program pays. And, and I don't know how much that's changing over time. But there's also going to be differences across states and over time in, in, in terms of um, yeah. you know, that dimension. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I just think that Bob was the guy that said, not even worked in Medicare for years, Bob Bergeron. He wrote this really interesting article about just private, you know, hospitals, you have price, you should be nice, that was really nice, but right, price takers versus the kind of haves and the have nots in terms of hospitals. You know, you have like a, you know, we all know these hospitals in particular cities that command. Well, what, one thing that we looked at, and, and I have to say, I, I don't have it, um, we ended up deciding there wasn't much there, but was just, we were concerned, you know, we're distinguishing these two types of expansion states in terms of the, the, their baseline level of Medicaid eligibility. Maybe what we're picking up when we see differences is that the exchange coverage is different. And we didn't really see anything uh, that way. There, there's no obvious pattern. I mean, j just looking at, I mean, we, we don't have really comprehensive data, but, but <coughs> SIA found a few different sources where people had, had you know, reported descriptive statistics on, on you know, narrow networks and, and high deductibles. And it looks sort of similar across our three categories. But I wonder whether it's not the exchange plans that are the issue, yeah. but it's the private commercial yeah. trends that that's making that choice to try to be in the exchange or in Medicaid more or less yeah. important. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that's a a, a margin that's gonna help us, but I, I see what you're saying. Let's let Tom uh, just yeah. since wrap up. Let's just let him Sorry. let's let him put up on let, let's let the yeah. money out of that which way can that All right. I'll I'll get it some results. That, that's what you're saying, right? Get some some results. Um, so so we're just we're also gonna go back to the, the age cut fast stats data because we don't have the information on private revenues to, to see if um, the the you know what at least number of patients, how that's changed. Um, our model is, is really simple. It's, it's just a, a, a different versions of a difference in differences model with hospital fixed effects. Um, just one, one uh, <coughs> small empirical issue is that the data are for hospital fiscal years, which don't correspond to the calendar year. So we're going to have a number of hospitals where FY14 um, you know, bridges the, the January 2014 start date. And what we do is we just um, measure our post variable as the percentage of, of the year, the fiscal year that is after January 2014. So if a hospital has a, a, a fiscal year that ends in end of June, the 2014 data is going to get a, a, a value, a, a, a 
the post variable is going to take a value of 0.5, um, and so on. So, so it, it's just a way of, of attributing the, the, the exposure. Um, and then, oh, the obvious concern with any kind of difference in differences model is uh, we're assuming that, that there's parallel trends. Um, since, we, since we're only using data going back to 2011, it's hard to, to you know, convincingly estimate a trend to the extent that we can do it. We're not seeing any um, major difference between uh, among the different categories in those three years before. And if you think back to that graph I showed you with the, with the discharge data, um, it did seem uh, like, the, like the parallel trends assumption is, is valid. Okay, so here's, here's, here's some results. Um, and, and yes. Yeah, no, um, thanks. So, so the, the, the first set of results is Medicaid revenue, and maybe this is sort of like a, you know, a duh kind of thing, because obviously Medicaid coverage is going up. We'd expect to see more Medicaid patients. Um, and what we see is, is that uh, for the average hospital in the expansion state, um, $6.7 million in additional Medicaid revenue relative to the, 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 the average for the whole sample. That's about a 25% effect. Um, you break down uh, our expansion states into the two categories. Not surprisingly, you see a larger change, both in terms of dollars and in terms of um, percent of baseline uh, in our major expansion states. But you do see an increase in minor expansion states. And again, that, that pattern lines up um, perfectly well with the, the, the population coverage data that I showed you. Um, and then just the last column expresses these uh, in log millions of dollars. So if you look then at uncompensated care expenditures, um, you know, the, the signs have changed. The magnitudes are a little bit smaller. Uh, we see that um, uh, uncompensated care fell by an average of $3.5 million in our expansion states taken as a group. Um, the, the, the average for the entire uh, sample um, in the pre-period was almost $10 million, so you know, like a 35% a, a effect. Um, and again, when, when, you, when you break down um, the expansion states into these two groups, you're seeing larger effects for the major expansion states, but you're still seeing uh, a decline in uncompensated care in these minor expansion states, despite the fact that, that coverage was changing overall the same in the non-expansion states. Um, and again, this points to, to the fact that in these non-expansion states, people were getting exchange coverage with high deductibles, which still uh, leads to a certain amount of uncompensated care. Um, so, so relative to um, uh, the, the you know, if you look at the, going back to, to um, the Medicaid uh, revenue, so in these major expansion states, it's going up by, by $7.4 million. And um, uncompensated care is falling by a little bit more than half of that. Uh, so, so that's suggesting that the Medicaid expansion is pulling in some previously <coughs> uninsured patients, but that's not the entire story. And so if you look at um, uh, these different measures of, of income, whether it's net income measured in millions of dollars, or, or operating margin, um, the, the broad grouping of expansion versus non-expansion, we see an uh, increase of about a million and a half dollars um, per year in expansion states relative to non-expansion states. Um, but then when you, you break it down by the two groups, you see that th the story is quite different in, in our major expansion, minor expansion states. Um, you know, we, we see a, a, a larger increase in net income in these major expansion states. Um, and the point estimate for, for minor expansion states is actually negative, although it's, um, it's very imprecise. And uh, when you look at an operating margin, you see the same thing. Um, overall, it looks like there's a, you know, if we group all our expansion states together, there, there's a small but, but significant increase in, in operating margin. Um, but that's really driven by uh, what's going on in these major expansion states. It's essentially a null result in the, in the non-expansion states. Um, which again, the, the way we interpret this is that um, in these major expansion states, the gain from adding all these uh, Medicaid um, 
enrollees and, and reducing the number of uninsured patients more than offsets whatever you lose in, in revenue relative to private, whereas in, in the minor expansion states, you're getting more Medicaid revenue, but you're losing private revenue, and, and it works out to be um, essentially a wash. So the, the issue of operating income, I want to get some more definitions. That, does that include, I'm assuming it excludes uh, in, interest income and, and things on investments, but you have other things like physician practices that may or may not be in the hospital and so when you say operating income, what, what entities are included in operating income? That, that, that's an a important question to which I don't have a very good answer. It, I can tell you what, so, so, so yeah, interest income, uh, uh, philanthropy, um, that's out. That's out. Uh, you know, money from, from, from parking and, and, and cafeteria, that's out. But, but what I don't know is, is to the extent that the, the the definition of the organization is changing. So like in early years, it doesn't include a physician practice and later it does. I, I think that's out. I think this is measured in a way that, that's, <coughs> this, this is inpatient. Um, so so I, I, I don't know enough about, about either of these cost reports in particular or, or hospital finance in general to know how much of a concern that is. It's just inpatient? I think it's, I think it's, uh, I, I may be wrong about that. Yeah. After I said that, I, so I, I don't know. I, I, that, that, that's an important thing to, to, to nail down. I agree. Well, there, there is no place in the old Medicare um, hospital system for, for physicians to have uh, uh, private patient So, um, oh, no. oh, okay. Yeah, so I, I don't, um, so say that again. That there, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I was hoping right you were going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, so that, that I'm pretty sure you're right about this. Must be only inpatient. Yeah. Well, it's it's it's. Inpatient hospital, non care. Right. They discharge people at right? Say that again. They probably don't discharge people that are just visiting to see a physician. I don't know how outpatient care that's provided in the facility counts into this. But you're saying it it, it should not be included mm -hmm. in this. Well, I'm, Even if the physicians are, are entirely within the right, because that's almost certainly a separate corporate entity anyway. Okay. Can you talk about what the big policy takeaways are from this um, Yeah, um, in a minute. <laughs> so let me to get to that a little bit. Uh, more quickly. So, so uh, because we can't observe the, the private revenue, we went back to the, the fast stats data and we looked at, at um, uh, changes in payer mix. And what we see is, this is for all discharges, um, what we see is that, that uh, the percent uninsured is, is falling in these major expansion states, Medicaid is going up, but there's also some decrease in, in, in the private share. Um, we don't see much overall in, in the, the minor expansion states because of the fact that Medicaid and, and, and private are offsetting. This is for all discharges. If you look at surgical discharges where I think the, the, the private markups are a little bit higher, um, you're seeing more evidence of, of uh, a negative impact on, on private patients relative to these non-expansion states, um, again, which is consistent with our interpretation of the, this crowd out story. Um, here's the bonus slide that I promised. This, this is from another thing we're working on, which is uh, using hospital emergency department data, state level discharge data. And a couple of things that are interesting. One, one is that the, the, um, the exp expansion, non-expansion contrasts sort of fit with what we're seeing on the inpatient side. But the other thing, getting back to, to, the, to the question somebody had, is um, we, we're not seeing any evidence that, oh, now we're getting people insurance, they're not showing up at the emergency department. Um, in, in fact, it looks like the opposite. Um, but what I, the reason I put it into this presentation is if you look at the, the payer mix in the emergency department, here again you see a little bit of um, uh, increase in, in percent private in the non-expansion states 
um, but not in the expansion states. Okay, so um, getting to, to, to uh, the, the policy impl implications. Um, this is just summarizing the results. Um, so, so, I th so I think the main policy implication is, or, or the main sort of trying to understand what's been going on, is th this puzzle of why is it that, you know, we're, we're clearly seeing reductions in uncompensated care, but hospitals are saying it's, it's kind of a, a mixed bag for us. Um, we, we think it's this distinction between what they're getting from, from Medicaid and what they're getting from um, private payers. I think the main uh, policy implication is, while it's interesting to look back and say what has gone on in the last year and a half, the real question is, if you are talking to legislators in a non-expansion state, is this something that they want to do? Um, and, and certainly if, if the hospital uh, association was talking to them, I think the answer would be yes. Because um, the, the most relevant point of comparison for these non-expansion states is our major expansion states. And we saw that in those states, this was a positive uh, uh, benefit to the hospitals. They're, they're, um, not only did, did uncompensated care fall, but their incomes went up. Um, so, so even if the, the results looking backwards are a little bit puzzling, the, the uh, implication is clearly, you know, hospitals in, in Florida should continue to, to lobby um, to, to expand coverage. Um, and then just, just um, uh, th th this, this is not, I won't claim these are policy implications of our analysis, but these are sort of policy issues that I think our, our uh, paper, you know, gets close to. I, I, um, so so this, someone else raised the question of disproportionate share program, and CMS is going to have to come up with um, uh, a method for reducing dish payments uh, as called for by the law. Um, I don't honestly think that our results give any guidance on that other than to say that um, we just can't assume because uncompensated care has been falling that all hospitals uh, in states that expanded Medicaid now have this big windfall that, that can be clawed back. Um, I think it's, it's more complicated than that. And um, another thing that, that our, our paper doesn't speak to directly, but I expect that we're going to be hearing more about in, in coming years, has to do with the... the the tax exempt treatment of, of nonprofit hospitals. Because if, if a lot of that um, historically has been justified by the provision of, of uncompensated care, um, as there's less and less uh, uncompensated care, I think this issue is going to uh, uh, be, be salient to, to say, well, what are we getting from these hospitals and, and what's the justification? And again, I don't think that our paper informs that decision either way, other than this is the type of thing that I think um, we're probably going to want to look at going forward. So that's what I got. <laughs> we have time for, uh, we have four minutes for more questions, comments, admissions. I don't want to comment. Is this Medicare cost data report is really a tough database to draw a lot of inferences from, yeah. especially when it comes to profitability. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a very, uh, there, it's, a, it's just not a, and unfortunately, I don't think there's anything yeah. to replace. And, and are there um, papers that you can direct me to and like sort of best practices for using these data? Because I, I, yeah. I, I feel like it, I'd like to know more about what's known about these data. Yeah, I, I, I can't give you that except my own experience. I'm just saying consultants. My own experience working with that data is that uh, it's it's a tough one. There, there's so many different ways to, to portray the data there yeah. that it's it's hard. But but in a short period of time, there shouldn't be any yeah. Well, in fact, even for these these variables that, that we're looking at, there there were multiple ways to to to, to calculate Medicaid revenue. I and mean, there, there's a number of different sources. And yeah, the big thing was trying to to do it in a way that shouldn't be influenced by things that are, that are also changing over this period. Yeah. Other questions? Um, so, sorry if I'm just a little bit behind on this, but, um, but I'm wondering, in your analysis going forward, are you able to, do you, do you think you'll be able to get more specifics on individual hospitals and what revenue what prices they're actually getting from private payers, and if you're able to get the information on the exchanges. I mean, I know most hospitals, this is proprietary information, it's really hard to get at prices, but that seems to be such a crucial question, and understanding the, you know, 
I, I think it's going to be very hard with national data to get at that. I still haven't completely given up hope about being able to at least categorize states in terms of the generosity of their Medicaid programs. Um, there, there is no comprehensive data on that. And I did uh, a project a few years ago looking at dental care where we thought, oh, we'll look at changes in, in what, what states pay dentists. And we had spent two years sort of like calling up state Medicaid offices to say, can you send us your, your fee schedule? Um, and so I don't want to do that again for this project. <laughs> but, but if there was some way where we, 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 we were confident by saying, you know, these are states that, that are like way below Medicare. These are states that are, you know, pretty close. I don't know if people have ideas. Well, you can probably classify hospitals according to the degree that they get this payments. And then again, you can look at high disproportionate care hospitals, which are presumably high Medicaid hospitals yeah. versus others, and then use the other data that you have about what state they're in and whether that's a high expansion state or not. And probably get a better look at what happens to the high Medicare, to the high Medicaid dependent hospitals um, pre and post ACA. Yeah, that, that's, that's actually a good suggestion. Just making sure that you use, there's, like a, there's a, a Medicaid, Medicare fee index, right, that people use. At the hospital level? I, I've seen it for yeah. physician care. Yeah, yeah. I thought there was also a, a hospital level for Um. Yeah, but if, 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 yes. if you, so, so Steve Zuckerman at Urban has, has put together over the years um, uh, the physician fees, and, and he does it by a range of different um, specialties, but, but that's just outpatient. Now, it's likely that, that states that are really cheap paying physicians are also cheap when they pay hospitals, um, and maybe that would be, if, if someone could tell me that's, that's definitely true, then, then I would um, just use that, but I, was, I wasn't sure. Well, it certainly does in, in anything we've done explicitly, and, and I don't know if, um, yeah, that would be another uh, another way to cut the states is, is, and I don't even have a prior on, you know, how that would go. Would, would Medicaid programs that, that have a high percentage, I mean, what's it like, 70% are in managed care anyway right now? Yeah, and, and I don't think they're... That, that, that's sort of what I was assuming yeah. is, is that, you know, some, some states, are like California has historically had really low rates and, and they put people into managed care, but they didn't give them more money to, to, right. to pay hospitals. Yeah. I think it's time for us to uh, thank our speaker again.